Hey, yeah, hey, you're yeah. in. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to the internet. Never lost that spirit and soul for turning people on to music that we love. <laughs> Perry calls your your phone. Uh, you pick up. You know, we like to share the process here, and uh, I think we may have some fun. I feel what we're curating is really great information, great entertainment. Anytime, call me. I'm there. Am I still on the internet? Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Raise Your Horns with me, Lizzie Hale. Uh, we got an amazing show coming up here. Um, I got one of my near and dear friends as a special guest. But uh, first, we're going to start out rocking because I think we all need, a, need a little bit of music right now. I'm going to do a special version of this for my freak family hanging out in the chat room right now. <laughs> I'm on the train that's pulling the sick and twisted Making the most of the ride before we get arrested We're all wasted and we're not going home tonight Covered in black, we lack the social graces Just like an animal, we crawl out of our cages They can't tame us so if you're one of us, get on the bus. Ready? If you're a freak like me, wave your flag. If you're a freak like me, get off your ass. It's our time now to let it all hang out. So shut if you're a freak like me, you were born to burn. This is no disease, you don't need a cure. It's our time. You go out if you're free like me. Underground, but we will not surrender. We're gonna give the summer to remember, yeah. So write your name in gasoline and set that shit on fire. If you're a freak like me, wave your flag. If you're a freak like me, get off your head. It's our time now to let it all hang out So shut if you're a freak like me Don't apologize, they can hold you down You're born to rise It's our time now to go out If you're a freak like me If you're a freak like me are you a freak like me? Are you a freak like me? Are you a freak like me? Wave your flag if you're a freak like me. Get off your ass. It's our time now to let it all hang out. So shout if you're a freak like me. Don't apologize. They can hold you down. You're born to rise. It's our time now to go out. If you're free like me, <laughs> yeah. All right. So, without further ado. And the reason I'm playing a baritone and the reason I'm playing that song, one of my dear, dear friends, golden human, legend in his own right, please welcome to the show, Mr. Chuck Garrick. Hi, Chuck. Hey, hey, hey. Thanks for having me. That was that was special. I felt like like it really was just me and you. I, I thought it was really that was that's I mean, people are getting such treats right now with with musicians, you know. 
letting it all hang out, playing these songs. And I mean, I can listen to you sing all day long, but I really oh, felt you. special. I kind of got a little, little bit oh, of the good I appreciate that, man. Yeah. I was just confirming that that was the, the, the positive special. And it's like, oh, no, that was, that was special. <laughs> no, it's good. fun. And I, I, I love doing this show and I love the, the communal aspect of it. But, um, and I love having my friends on and, and yeah. it's 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 challenging because it's you know I'm I'm used to having you know my band behind me doing all this stuff so I've been I've been digging deep and it's 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 just as therapeutic for me than I hope it is for anybody watching. But um, of course it is. But, I mean, yeah. I think what, what you're doing is such a great thing, and it's like I said before. I mean, you you're really you know you're using your voice in a positive way and and using your talents to uh, look. I mean just hearing that song for the couple of minutes that it was, I was not thinking about anything but the song and, and what was happening. And so I, I really cherish those moments. I think people, especially that are having hard times that are going through difficult times with this whole pandemic and things like that, when you can just take a minute, even if it's a minute or three minutes or whatever, just to feel a little peace and joy. It, it, it helps. It just it brings you, it just centers you a little bit. So you centered me. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad, man. I appreciate that. You know, it's a, it's, it's such a, you're such a positive force, you uh -huh. know, and, um, and for, for those of you watching, um, you know, Chuck is, uh, uh, the, bass player for Alice Cooper. Um, he's also played with LA Guns and Dio and um, has an amazing, amazing band um, uh, it, called Bisto Blanco um, that if you have not heard of yet, um, you are you are not alive yet. So that's that's you got to go, you know, get reborn. Um, but uh, but no, Chuck, like just, you know, off stage and on stage, you're such a positive force. And um, it's beautiful to to see how you've been you know, spending, spending your time. And, um, uh, I know you're in California right now visiting your yeah. mom. Yeah. Visiting my mom. So, uh, yeah, I've been spending some time since this whole thing started as you know, most musicians were, we were on the road. I mean, I was on the road with Bisto in March and all of a sudden the, uh, the world went lopsided and, um, we had to kind of not even have a new plan. We just had to go along with whatever was in place. And, uh, I, uh, Stop shaving. <laughs> you don't stay. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to know how long you've been, uh, how long you've been quarantined or how long we've been away from touring, it's been this long. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like we were talking about earlier, you never know what kind of gifts you get or what kind of situations which could be, you know, as scary as, as the pandemic and, and as much negativity as, as it's had on um, the world there's been some positives and I always try to look at things in, in, in different perspectives and uh, different ways of thinking about things. But for me, this has been uh, an amazing opportunity because I would be on the road right now, but I have a, a mother who is, um, who's dealing with some serious health issues. She has primary progressive aphasia. So my mom has lost the ability to communicate through speech. Um, she only sort of can say yes or no, um, but the worst thing about it is um, it's also associated with dementia, which, as we all know, is is um, a terrible d disease to watch somebody go through. But um, I'm here. I've been here for the last almost month now, um, just taking care of her and, and getting her set up for her new normal and, and her, her future. And, uh, and we're having a good time. There's been lots of, um, laughter and, and, um, we're trying to have a sense of humor through all this, but there's also a lot of tears and a lot of heartbreak and a lot of just self, you know, uh, reconnecting with, uh, you know, my intentions and, and, and where I've come and where I've gone and what I've done and, and realizing that, you know, this little bleep of life that we have, because, you know, I'm looking at photos and I'm here, I am looking at this woman who just, you know, I remember her as that person in this photo 20 years ago, but now she's, she's this and dealing with uh, her situation. You realize how short time is yeah. and how valuable it really is. So during this, this pandemic and during this change in our careers and during this downtime, I've been blessed to be able to spend it with my mother and, and, um, and reconnect on a totally different level. Um, it's been life changing, and uh, I think it's it's again she's not realizing it, but again she's teaching me another valuable lesson. Yeah, 
I, you know, and and that's I, that's an amazing thing. Um, you know, and, and I'm not I'm not well versed in in uh, in the ailment of de, of dementia, but I think that it's such a beautiful thing that I you I I know your mom knows. You know, it's like just because she's unable to communicate, she knows. You know, and and that's. Yeah. That's such a beautiful thing, and and you're such a patient man, and and I, she's really lucky to have you. You know, I'm trying, I'm trying. The patience, you know, every once in a while, I have to. You know, it's it's sad because sometimes I wonder how much she does retain or where where she actually is at times because she she will just sort of she'll just go off, you know, and then I'll I'll ask her, you know, what what day is it or where where is she at? She she'll re, she'll re, she'll respond with the correct answers, but sometimes it takes her a while. Um, and, uh, and, you know, with the patients, I think I, I realized that, I, yeah, I'm, I'm patient because, well, this is sort of my take on life. There's really only two ways you can go about it. Um, and, and I'm going with the one that I think works. There's either fear or there's love, yeah. right? So if you, if I'm living in fear and fearful of, of taking care of my mom or fearful of the disease or fearful of and this is a truth fearful of having to change her clothes or help her go to the bathroom, which is something I have to do. Yeah. Um, which I was at first. Now it's like, I'm not and everything we do now is just, I'm with, is with love. It's I'm taking care of her. I'm, I'm filling myself up. I'm filling my tank up with love and I'm filling hers up and the whole environment in the house changes, you know, and, and, and um, it's, it's, it's just an easier way to go through things. So I also give myself a break because, shit, I'm not a caretaker. Um, you know, two months ago I, or three months ago, I was just a guy on stage, you know, playing rock and roll, doing what I love to do. And now all of a sudden I've got this wholly different, totally different responsibility, a life responsibility. And um, so uh, I just approach it with, with as much love as I possibly can. And, uh, and I don't listen to any of the fear thoughts, the doubt thoughts. Good. You know? yeah. That's, that's like, I think that, that, everybody can kind of take that to heart right now, no matter what situation you're in, like you have yeah. a choice, you know, you can either enter into whatever you got to do today with fear or with love. And, and yeah. it sounds like you're, <laughs> you, you, you got that one. <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy. And, and I, again, like I said, that, was, that moment of that three minute song or two minute song that you play, it's like, it, it takes you away. And those moments you have to cherish, man. Because I think that's time that you kind of it kind of heals the armor a little bit, where you're not worried, you're not stressed, mm -hmm. you're just you're just living, you're just breathing, and you're just listening. Those times, maybe that that does kind of chip the cracks that have happened with all the stuff that's going on in your life. So then you kind of rebuild. You know, it doesn't take much to feel good. That's true. Yeah. That's yeah. absolutely true. And then that's the power of music too. I mean, yeah. we talk about this a lot. Yeah. Whereas like music. You know, and the fact that we both are in music as as a career choice, but it's not so much. It's not about the career. That's like a perk. You know, the perk that perk. we're able to like do that. You know, for a living mm -hmm. is awesome. Um, but just that escape that you get. You know, and the the opportunity to to every single night. You know, I mean, you know, back when we were on stage. You know, you can walk out on stage and you can be that that person that you want to be, and you can be that that best version of yourself. But also you know, when you're listening to music or when you're creating music, it is a form of meditation. It's it, like, uh, you don't know, <laughs> hi, cat. <laughs> you got a, you got a buddy <laughs> uh, right behind you, Chuck. You got a little oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm allergic to cats, by the way. I'm at my buddy's oh, house. Stay yeah. outside. <laughs> All the cat lovers are like, it's okay. Like, what was I talking about? Fear and love? I am now in fear mode. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you just leap out of the chair. <laughs> what are we talking about? Oh, but yeah, well, you know, man, as far as, um, you know, touring goes, I mean, we had this amazing tour together last summer. Oh. Um, you know, we got to go out, um, you know, with, with, uh, with Alice Cooper and got to hang every single day with you, Chuck, yeah. which, uh, which is awesome. And, you know, for some reason we're not sick of each other yet. So that's a good sign. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious. And, and I know, I know a lot of these things because we're friends. Um, but for, you know, the people that aren't familiar, you know, I say again, you know, he's, uh, Chuck here has shared the stage with Ted Nugent and Billy Bob Thornton, Don Felder, Journey, et cetera, et cetera. 
touring musician for LA Guns at one point, uh, got some Ronnie James Dio in, which is amazing. And, um, and he's presently, um, what are you, are you're like, you're like the lifer bandmate for Alice Cooper, aren't you? <laughs> I've been there longer than, than any, buddy. You no, know, actually any musician he's had aside from him. I mean, uh, it's been, it was one of those things where I think it was whatever, 2001, 2002, when I got the gig. And I remember I didn't actually, I wasn't even offered the gig. I was offered a chance to jam with the band. And, and I did. And Alice wasn't even really there. It was just two of the guys. It was Eric Singer and Eric Dover at the time. But uh, they had said, hey, we got this TV show we're doing on uh, Fox television. It was Kelly Clarkston when she just got done with um, – you know, American Idol. And we were going to do three songs for live television. School's Out, Under My Wheels, and I think Lost in America. Um, and uh, so my first time meeting Alice Cooper was actually physically him in makeup. I mean, I was on stage. I didn't, I had never met him before or anything. And here he comes walking out with his cane and top hat. And I think if you find that video, you'll probably see me like playing like Oh. Like I was just completely like freaked out, you know, that this, this was actually happening and there he is. And, and so after the show, we, we, um, we had to stick around for a while and we ended up playing basketball in the backstage area. Um, and I remember looking at him and I go, yeah, this is going to be cool. If I get this gig, yeah, maybe this will last for a year or two. You know, this might be kind of fun for you. Or two. It's been 17 years. <laughs> and, this guy just keeps going. I've never met anybody, and you know this. You can attest oh, yeah. to this. He loves what he does, and he and he does the same thing every night. Gives it like he's still looking looking for success, like he's still trying to prove himself. It's the most amazing thing I've ever witnessed. You know, it's really cool. It's like you, you literally never run out of dreams. And uh, <laughs> I I got to talk with Alice um, two weeks ago. And uh, and yeah, the same thing. He's like, it, it's like it's like he's a uh, like uh, like a new act. You know, he yeah. touts himself as like, oh no, like we got this coming up, and there's all these opportunities. I'm like, opportunities. <laughs> they know you. <laughs> you know, it's like, but that's what it is. So that's I think awesome. He's just a selfish, greedy. Man. He he's really so, is. He's greedy. He's so greedy. He he wants it all, all, doesn't he? Come on. He really does. Oh, well, you know. I've got something to prove. I will, one quick story. I will say when I really realized what Alice Cooper's about as a person, as a real person, I realized we had the opportunity several years ago, I think it was like 2006 or something, to open for the Rolling Stones. And we had 30 minutes. And he could, and he's never out before, you know, 15 minutes before showtime. He was out there you know, kind of warming up and stretching out and getting ready. And he's like, we're going to, and he was pumping us up. And it's normally not his way of doing things, but he, he came out on stage, like, like with a vengeance, man, like David Lee Roth and early Van Halen days, just running and, and just get, like, he seriously was looking for a record deal or out to show people like this is who Alice Cooper is. And I and I and I watched him from that day. I always I always kept that in mind. I went, you know what? You you always seize the opportunity, right? You never know when is your opportunity going to happen. And and I and I think that you know, for me, it was like he lives. He lived his ultimate dream from all the success that he's had, these millions of records that he sold. He's never got a chance to open for the Rolling Stones. You know, his <laughs> mentors there they are, and it was really great to see him act as the little kid was still something to prove, you know? That is amazing. I, you know, and uh, yeah, and like with you and I, it's like, those are the things that like we strive for. Like, okay, oh. yeah, you know, <laughs> if Alice Cooper can still get like geeked out over something and not call it in, you know, and, and when we were out on tour with you guys, like none of, well, none of you did. There was yeah. not one night that anybody that we like that, Anybody was like, oh, yeah, they're tired today. You know, it's like nobody. It's like. Well, I was just performing for you on the side of the stage. Oh, oh you were definitely were. Yeah. So for, I was just strutting around. So, you, so you, and Judy, you and Judy would, you know, blush a little bit. Absolutely. You know, 
got, you got to give the girls something, you know. Um, yeah, no. So for those of you just listening, uh, my my spot during that tour was always on Chuck's side, yeah. you know. So it's like I'd be side stage there and in between songs <laughs> and every yeah. single time. So so uh, you guys would get me up to sing uh, to sing and play well and play schools out every single yeah. night, yeah. and and every single time we'd get to like maybe maybe a song or two beforehand you'd have a break yeah and on the side stage and without fail chuck would be especially for the first couple of times i fell for it every single time chuck would be like be like okay so we changed the key um <laughs> it's gonna be fine but you know just just like watch me and, and like what uh what like so because I'm, I'm already nervous <laughs> and you knew that too and i knew then, it like, yeah okay. so everything it's still the same song but <laughs> <laughs> There's a little twist. We don't even know what it is yet, but just go ahead and follow us. What could go wrong? But you are going to be the loudest guitar in the mix. Have a great show. <laughs> oh, <fuck> <laughs> It, we're all counting on you. Yeah. It hasn't been the first time that's actually happened to me. Uh, sure. the, the, the last time it was really under pressure that that happened to me was when um, – I performed with uh, Eric Church on the CMAs. Oh wow! And, so, and this is like we were like fresh Nashville, so we didn't know any country, nothing. We're yeah. I'm, I'm I'm standing there with my leather jacket amongst all these yeah, cowboy guys. Like, I don't know. He looks like he's somebody, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Is. You know, we're walking backstage, and we had rehearsed this song called "That Damn Rock and Roll," and and Eric mm -hmm. seeked me out to be kind of this like ambassador for the rock side to kind of bring that together and so i'm like sure of course i'll say yes so we rehearsed the song i know the song all the you know all the changes he had his part i had mine right before he went into this elevator thing that's supposed to like launch him onto stage why yeah. yeah lizzie lizzie was like back she's like lizzie come here come here come here I'm like what he's like okay so i've been thinking I know we had everything like set during rehearsal, but but like somewhere around like the last chorus ish something, I'm going to step back and then you just do something cool. You just do something cool. I'm like, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. What? 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 me? What? You know, this is live television on in a format that I have no business being in. It's a big look, you know, like Nicole is out there, you know, it's like it's all this stuff. So yeah. um, so but it was so incredibly awesome of him because it was very generous. So like I ended up I think I blacked out because I made <laughs> a moment and then like after the show, I'm like, was that good? And then they're like, yeah, was that yeah. cool. Was it cool? Was it cool? No, it wasn't cool. Yeah, so, I'm no stranger to that. But I'm also like that is like a heightened sense. So every time you said that to me, I got that same feeling like, okay, all of a sudden wheels start turning. <laughs> like, okay, what can I do? What's going on? I got to like focus. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. it. I'm trying right. to make you stay present. That's um, amazing. So I, I, I kind of want to go back to the beginning a little bit with you, Chuck. When, I, when did, uh, when did music first grab you? I, I know you, you talked a little bit about your mom and I know uh, uh, you grew up with parents that were some somewhat off the normal beaten path in a very positive way yeah. uh, were, were your parents into it as well when you first gravitated oh, they, my parents love the fact that i was grasping onto music you know um i i my mom and dad uh were um you, you wouldn't know it by no meeting them nowadays although my dad has passed from now but my dad used to ride with a notorious biker gang in the early 20s of his life you know and in the san francisco era and 60s and my mom happened to be part of that and they met and fell in love and and the rest is history i came into this world my mom already had four children at that time my brothers and sisters uh, half brothers, half sisters, who again, I, I believe every Leonard Skinner song was written about them. They are that hitchhiking kids throughout the country and have been and still are to this day, the epitome and the definition of the 70s. But um, I grew up in a small town in Lake Tahoe. There was hardly any real music scene except for, you know, Grateful Dead type bands and things like that, hippie bands. Um, and uh, a couple blues based cover bands that did a couple originals, but, um, I, I never really got into the jam band thing. It just wasn't my thing. I wasn't a hippie child. You know, I loved rock and roll and, and immediately was taken by it. Um, and at an early age, I <clears throat> would just bang around in the pots and pans like most kids. And in school, they didn't offer, they didn't offer anything electrical. I, I, I wanted to play drums, but I didn't really really consider it but i i wanted to sort of make noise so i ended up 
picking up the trumpet at a young elementary school age. But um, it wasn't until my neighbors across the street from me. And I think about this a lot because I, I wonder if I, it, it, in a small town that I lived in, I mean, literally there was maybe like less than 20,000 people. I happened to live a block and a lot away from two guys that will forever change my life. And they were brothers and one played drums and the other one played guitar. And at 16, Mike Kukoris could play Van Halen and Led Zeppelin and all those stuff like really well. And his brother could play and all they needed was a bass player. And I never thought about being a bass player, but I saved up my money and I, I purchased a bass and uh, I started to learn to play it. And that's when music just started taking off. It was like, all of a sudden I'm discovering really what, Oh, not only is Led Zeppelin a band, but who, you know, John, who John Paul Jones is and who, you know, uh, Bob Daisley and all these bass players that started to come into my life and the Beatles and all this stuff. And music started to just become like this, this shower of awesomeness because it was like all of it was just happening at this time. And, and I would go down to San Francisco and there was a band there that was, you know, uh, big club band at the time you might have heard of them called metallica and i used to go <laughs> i used to go watch them play the clubs in san francisco you know and it was wild to see that but i think that's when you know i realized that at a you know about that teenager era area in my life where i realized that school wasn't something i was good at but music was something that I had a passion for and it, it, it seemed to come natural for me. So um, it was, you know, at an early age and uh, I, you know, developed this passion for music and like yourself. Uh, and uh, when my time came to make a decision on what I was going to do with my life, you know, I, I, um, I've chose music school, you know, and, and drove to LA and, and, and went to music school and, and just started, you know, that journey of, you know, learning different styles of music and becoming part of the business. And, and we talked earlier about feeling not good enough and not, not talented enough. And, you know, at the time in the eighties, you're, you know, there's so many things going on and, and, and so many directions, but um, I've always sort of kind, kind of kept that, uh, that drive, you know, that we talked about that as well, but, just drive towards music. And I always stay, say that if you, uh, you have a passion for something, you have a love for something, you just got to stick with it um, re regardless of what it is. Um, because um, you, there's a, there's a nice feeling about that when you, when you actually can see yourself accomplishing some of your goals and dreams. And for me, it took, you know, up, up until my thirties into my life to actually see some success. And there was a lot of failures, but I, uh, yeah, music still to this day. I'm still a big fan of it. I still love discovering it. I still love being in the middle of it. And I am for more grateful for the opportunity to be a musician and touring musician right now than I think I've ever been in my entire life. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that that doesn't, you know, people people talk about, you know, growing out of things and you know I, I know a lot of i know a lot of musicians that you know that's that's their prerogative and they have like this like slew of su success and then you like never hear from them again and yeah. i always think about that like i'll never be one of those musicians that just like okay like that's i'm just gonna sit in my house and you know i, I don't yeah. know it, I, you're, you're gonna have to pry me off that stage and i know you're you're one of those too you're you're a lifer man I and, feel, uh, yeah. yeah and and yeah. and that it it does rejuvenate itself. It's like the, I'm not the same person that I was when we first started this band. Not at all, you know. Um, but you still, it's that core thing that still stays there. But then you yeah. keep like, I don't know. You keep rediscovering why mm -hmm. you love music and why you're in this. And uh, it's such a beautiful thing to be a part of. It really is, and it's and it's such a wonderful thing to be part of now, especially for our, for fans and people that we get to meet because it's. It's everybody sort of has a different channel to to their to their favorite bands and their favorite musicians now and where we didn't I didn't have that really, you know, growing up. And um, I think there's a good thing and a bad thing about it. But, you know, I know like, I, you, you know, you really had to go to a concert to to be in it, to see it, to, to be part of it. And um, I think as fans, there is that there's that community. 
uh, that you felt when you were in the crowd. And now there's even this, this larger community of, of people able through social media and things to, to interact and become part of this community. And, and you realize that even though maybe metal is not the most popular genre anymore, man, what a massive killer community of that of people oh, yeah. that is you know and and i'm just so glad to be part of that and and uh and i love all genres of music but i always consider myself a rock and roll metalhead for sure oh know? yeah absolutely and and you know p- you know people talk about the popularity of things i mean we didn't get into rock and metal because it was popular yeah that's true um, it's like i i and that was honestly like it, it and it took me you know literally showing some friends of mine an Alice Cooper CD at one point when I was 11 to discover that, yo, yeah, okay, so nobody really listens to this but me. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll, I'll deal. Um, I am, apparently I'm weird. It's okay. Um, but, uh, but you know, we don't get into it because it's popular. We, we get into it. I, I always say that, you know, I think that this, this genre chooses you, not the other way around, because I, I think that maybe yeah. if we had had our druthers, we'd be like, well, yeah, we want to be cool. Let's go just yeah. go to the pop route yeah. or something. And, and you know, the but, fun thing too, is I think about with like music, because like, it, it, it's just like people and it's a, it's got its own heartbeat. Um, and I've never just like, when I, when I meet somebody, I meet somebody, I look at them as the spirit of who they are, not of anything other than that. And I and I, when I listen to music, I, I listen to it the same way because it may not be a genre of music, but because of having an open mind and an open heart, I realized I learned so much because my dad at a later time in his life started to play the banjo because he had such a, a fascination with the Civil War music and all the stories that it told. And he really and God, he would practice eight hours a day every day. And he just and and, and he kind of was getting good at it you know <laughs> but he really at the end he really was doing really well but it took him a long time because he didn't have that that natural talent but we would go on long drives and I would want to put in my Dio cassette or whatever you know and he'd go all right so we'll listen to you know one track one side of your stuff but you got to listen to Bill Monroe and you know uh, you know Glenn Campbell and and you know, even all the old stuff that he loved to listen to, I'd have to listen to that. And it wasn't my genre of music. I didn't want to. But because of it, I learned so much about songwriting and, you know, melody. And now when I listen to those songs, it brings me back to a really cool place when I listen to those artists because I have a connection with them. I would have never have had that if it wasn't for, you know, having the opportunity to somebody else show you something else that's out there you know and that's the cool thing about music and and metal i think has such a wide variety of artists it's not just one little thing right it's there's so many other talents and there's so many other ways that they can reach you with with their you know with their music and so uh, i think some people you know when you were a kid you're either you're either like a stoner or a jock you know and and i kind of was both why not be everything yeah, you you don't have to label yourself. You just got to be open to everything, and yeah, yeah. what gets you excited. Yeah, uh, that that's cool. So so, how did you go from listening to that Dio cassette tape to then all of a sudden uh, touring with him for an yeah, article? yeah, right. So um, uh, it's a really interesting story. I had um, kind of given up on the idea of being, you know, in a not necessarily in a band, but maybe the idea of, of smelling the, the diesel from a tour bus. I thought that's just not going to happen. I ended up having, um, you know, my daughter Alicia was born and I uh, thought, well, you know what? We moved back up to Lake Tahoe and I started a construction business and uh, was very successful at it. Uh, but I still longed for music and I still was writing and, and playing in you know, bands in the, in, in the area. And, uh, but when I ended up divorcing and I had custody of my daughter, I looked at her, she's three years old, and I said, I've got one more, I got one more in me. You know what I mean? Put me in, coach. I can do this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, I packed her, her and myself up in a U-Haul and my 64 Cadillac, I towed in the back of it, and we drove to LA and I got an apartment and it was ridiculous and it was stupid and I got responsible 
responsibilities for this kid now and I'm just going, what have I done? What am I doing to her life? And I go, well, maybe one day it'll, it'll, I'll teach her to just go for it, you know? And, and um, there's, there's going to be some obstacles and it's going to be hard, but you know what, maybe I'll, there's a lesson here for her and myself. And it turned out that I was right. And I got the gig with um, uh, LA guns who was um, doing a little three month tour. Uh, and uh, I took it, there was no money in it. Um, and my mom came and, and watched my daughter as I did this three month run. I think I made $700. And, uh, but from that, right. I got a call a couple of, after they had reunited as the original band, I got a call a couple of months later from Wendy Dio, who just, my name just happened to come up just as a weird, somebody had overheard them talking about needing a bass player where they wanted to audition bass players. And he, the guy said, I know the perfect guy. Nice. And they go, who? And they said my name. They had no idea who I was. And Wendy had called my cell number, which I still have the same number today. That's awesome. And she says, this is Wendy Dio. And I went, Wendy Dio? You know. She says, would you like to, uh, we'd like to have you audition for Ronnie's band. And I'm a Ronnie James Dio. And she <laughs> goes, yes. You know, and I'm like, okay. In the back of my mind, I'm going, I know every I know them all. Rainbow, Black Sabbath, Dio. I know them all. Which songs? Oh, we're, you know, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll call you in a little bit and give you the, the um, set list. So I, I sat there for a minute. I couldn't believe it was actually happening. Like, that's, that can't be happening. But sure enough, she called me back, gave me the set list of songs to learn. And uh, two weeks later, I, I'm in a rehearsal room with Craig Goldie and Simon Wright. And, uh, and in comes... Ronnie James Dio. And uh, you met Ronnie and, and yeah. you, 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 I instantly just, I was nervous. I was scared. I was excited because here's my hero and I can't wait to hear him sing these songs that I'm going to play bass on, you know, right? And he was, he made me feel so welcome and so, um, you know, just, you know, just such a genuinely nice guy. And, uh, and we, we, uh, you know, we did um, uh, evolution and stargazer and man on the silver mountain and, you know, rainbow in the dark and all these songs that we did like three songs, you know, seven, six, seven songs. And, and uh, the best part of the story is, um, well, there's two great parts. One is that he asked me, he goes, well, what are you, what are you doing in November? And I said, nothing. And he goes, uh, do you want to go on tour with us? We're going to tour with Man, with Man of War and Motorhead in, okay. in Scandinavia. And I said, yeah. And he goes, you got a passport, right? And I go, yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a passport. <laughs> I had no idea that I even needed one at this point. So <laughs> I immediately uh, ran to the post office and um, signed up for, a, for a, the passport, which was um, – you know, scary in itself. because I was thinking, Oh my God, am I going to miss this opportunity? Cause I don't have this stupid ID. But anyway, the best part of the story was I idolized Bob Daisley, who is, you know, bass player for Ozzy's band and Uriah Heep and rainbow and such a prolific lyricist and songwriter. And he was the guy they were considering. Oh, wow. And Bob was obviously a very established bass player at that time and liked to sort of bounce around from what I was told on some of the, the songs and not play sort of what was written. And when we got to heaven and hell and it's man, I was just, that's exactly what I played. You know, I played everything exactly like the record or what, you know, they were playing live, what Ronnie was used to. And, uh, uh, I made sure of it, not for any other reason, just because I wanted it to be good. I wasn't there to show off. I was there to play these songs. I just wanted to hear the guy sing it. Yeah. You know, right. So anyway, uh, yeah, I ended up getting the gig and, um, that was my first time ever touring with somebody like, you know, uh, like that and, um, a real tour bus and hotel rooms and per diem and a salary. And, and I was over in Europe and, the other special thing was that one of my favorite bands of all time is Motorhead. I, you know, I hail and love Lemmy and Phil and Mickey and all the original guys. And I just love that band so much. So I sat 
um, just like you did on the side of the stage of the Alice Cooper concert. But in awe, and I just sat there and watched Motorhead every night. Every single night I sat there and watched the show. And um, it was one of the best times in my life. And I thought, all right, I made it. This is great. Thank you, God. I'm good. This is awesome. I got to play with Dio. And so we did the whole run, and it lasted uh, you know, a couple of months. And then I did uh, more European runs with him and Japan. And then, uh, and then Jimmy Bain came back into the picture. Uh, and then I uh, got the audition to play with Alice Cooper. That's that's amazing, dude. And and I I love you. You still you still <laughs> tell that story with such excitement, like you're actually like reliving it. And I, that just makes I am me happy because <laughs> it's like it's got to be true. And that was your first time in Europe, I guess. Yeah. Right? So yeah, yeah. Like, you know, it was you know, when it was it was such my first time that I I never again coming from where I came from. I never stayed in hotels. I've stayed in motels. Yeah. I've stayed in RVs, but I've never stayed in a hotel with a mini bar. So I come into my hotel room in in Copenhagen, and there's all this chocolate and nuts and all this alcohol, and I'm thinking, this is amazing. Look at all this free stuff, right? <laughs> so I clean it out. I am, you know, I come downstairs with a beer and, and we're talking and I'm hanging out with everybody. And I go, man, that's awesome that they supply you with all that stuff. <laughs> and the guys just go, what? I go, yeah, the beer. You guys don't have beer and the chips and stuff in your room? And they're like, dude, you got to pay for that. I go, <laughs> wait, what you do? <laughs> so my first in incidental bill was quite high. <laughs> well, you know, an expensive lesson, but it was enjoyable at least, you know. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, dude. It, it, it's, it's crazy when you get on the road. Um, the very first time we ever went on the road, uh, we went out with uh, Seether and Shinedown. And, yeah. uh, and, and those boys made sure that, like, we didn't know what a rider was. Like, they're like, right. what do you want on your rider? So we're like, oh, peanut butter and jelly and here's some tequila and whatever. Like, we just like, and they gave us all of it, you know. Yeah. And then we went on the next tour. And uh, the next one went out. We we had to fight like for like uh, like six bottles of water before stage. Like we got okay. nothing, you know. Um, so it's like yeah, it's 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 the road is weird. It's like it depends on who's actually taking care of. Yeah, and you guys were so great to us when we when Beasto had a chance to open for you guys and and you just took such. It, but it's true, you know. I, I still have the card that you wrote us that was in the dressing room and. But you made us feel comfortable. You know that it's a grind being out there anyway. And, and but I, I never felt uncomfortable. You know, I always I always felt like it was an instant family. And even though we had known each other, obviously for for quite a long time before that, my other guys in the band just they could still be there on tour with you right now. They just love you guys to death, and uh, we just had such a great time. Oh, we had such a great time with you guys, and and uh, let's let's talk Bisto Blanco for a second, because I know we've you know obviously you you are, you know you've you've toured Legends, you've done all this, but this is really this yeah. band is very near and close to your heart, and yeah. um, this is a brother Latham, Chris Latham, and um, and uh, Jan Legro and 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 Tim uh, Husung, which I can never pronounce his last name right. Uh, yeah. Also Calico Cooper, Alice Cooper's daughter, who obviously the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. <laughs> With her, um, I, like, I, how how did you end up getting together, and what, like, when when did this come about? How long have you been with Bisto Blanco? And well, you know, I'm, I'm sure you can relate to this. Um, you know, when you, I've been with Alice, you know, since 2002, and it was about 2013 or so. I, I'd realized like I'd, I'd I had all this material. Yeah, that I'd been writing for Alice, and and uh, you know, Bob. Uh, Bob Ezrin so graciously told me it's just not going to work for Alice. Of course. So don't, yeah. don't submit any more songs, Chuck, because uh, they're not Alice Cooper songs. So I go, yeah, but listen to this one. This could be great, Bob. But uh, <laughs> so it was, and I have to thank Bob for that. But um, I, um, I had all this material, all this stuff and this ideas of what, what I, now that I've been on the road for so long, what I'd like to see, if I could do it, this is how I would do it. And I, and I always had this vision of, you know, Calico, because I, I toured with her for so long about her, seeing her on stage with the theatrics and what, what, she's possible, what she's capable of doing stage-wise, because she's such a great entertainer. But also I knew she could sing really well, and she didn't even really realize it. 
So I figured this could be like a, a fun thing for us to do and, and get some of this material out. And boy, it just kind of took off into something that we, you know, weren't really expecting, but we've, we've had a great time. And Bisto now has, you know, three studio records and a live album, and we've been able to tour, you know, throughout Europe and, and, uh, and the States with, with you guys. And we toured over in Europe with um, another big German band called the Berse Uncles. And, um, you know, we've done some festivals over there. And um, so, you know, we, we, uh, we've developed this, you know, our brand. And um, we've done well on the Monsters of Rock cruises and the Mega Cruises and things like that. And, and the fans have really taken to us. And, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that what we do, we try to just keep it genuine. We try to keep it real. We try to keep it creative. Um, we, we pull from artists that we love, like yourselves. And uh, we, you know, there's things that we, we, we learned so much when we were on tour with you guys. I mean, Calico especially goes, I need to slow down. I go, what do you mean? She goes, I watch Lizzie every night. And she's just so you know, in charge. And I watch the way she sings. I'm listening. And, you know, I think I could do more. And so everybody's analyzing, everybody's picking and choosing the things that we can, that we're, that could, that we could apply to our own show or our own lives. And, and I think that now we've come and I'm sure you can understand this. I kind of feel like we're a band now. Like we've, we've kind of figured out who we are, you know, <laughs> We're not. I look back to old photos and old videos, and I just cringe. I go, "Oh my God, what were we thinking? You know, why were we doing that song, or what was I wearing?" But um, it's it's been a it's been a really cool journey, man, and it's been a lot of fun being able to have Bisto, um, you know, take off and do the things that it's been doing, and and uh, sort of like your little baby, you know. And I'm I've got um some of my best friends in the band with me so it makes it like a just a easy time absolutely well yeah, i think that's important and and uh and you're it's funny you talk about like early times like everybody's got their early times and you don't have to have it all figured out when when you start out believe me you know like i'm so glad that we didn't just like stay the same when you know oh, when I was 13 uh, with a keytar and stuff and playing yeah. Thanks and, and <laughs> right. you know, it's a, one of those things where it's you know we all got our past, but I, I just I love you guys so much, and for oh. uh, and you know for those of you listening, um, you know Bisto Blanco to me like when we went out on tour, I I, I hate I, I hate trying to describe bands because it's never right, but to me it's like this spirit of of obviously there's this spirit of Lemmy, which you know obviously there's a lot of Motorhead influence, but yeah. it's got this like almost like um just a touch of like what what maybe if rob zombie was just like was was you know a younger act what that energy of that kind of modern always looking forward there's always something about your show that I, it's like i can't pinpoint it you know i can never i use a i use a quote by you all the time in interviews oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Sorry. truth i always say well you know, when I want to name drop, I say, well, you know, Lizzie Hale said one time when she saw Bisto Blanco, which was, I didn't want to go to the bar and get a drink. I didn't want to use the restroom. I didn't want anybody to talk to me because I felt like if I took my eyes off that stage, I was going to miss something. It's absolutely true. Because we, yeah. we went and saw a full show of yours on our day, on that day off because you, you guys yeah. don't take lightly to days off you just kept playing <laughs> and i'm like well oh. you're making fifty dollars a show yeah. you know? <laughs> it's good money it's good money um i i uh it, it, i just loved it and and i felt bad because like there were like fans that wanted to come up and say hi but i'm just like Shh, wait yeah. just wait till the break wait till the break <laughs> i'll be here you know um and honestly guys anybody listening right now if you have not um gotten to witness uh calico cooper dragging this murder bat it's bat with a bunch of nails and paraphernalia on it um across the stage and um you know and i i feel like there's been a lot of accidents or near accidents that might have happened with that thing I've only been almost Are you always keeping one? it in the in the periphery she's only only almost killed me once <laughs> Th thus far <laughs> yeah. she missed me by that much 
You know, um, I love there's a there is a sense of danger with with Bisto. And the the one thing I love the most about Bisto Blanco is yes, we have our set list and we know what the song is going to be, but we don't know what the show is going to be. Of course not. Yeah. You know, we don't know yeah. where anybody's going to be at times and I love that. And I love the freedom. Calico has such a freedom about her. She doesn't have any reservations. She she clicks into her character and she just goes and she's not thinking of anything else. What are people going to think about me? What if, you know, this happens or that happens? I'm sure she is, but you'll never, ever read that of her on stage. She is in it. She is in it 100%. And at the end of the show, the girl is exhausted and she gives it her all. And I like her father, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, they dominate their domain. And when they're on stage, that's their place. They own it. Yep. I, I, and it shows. And I, that's what I love about you guys. And so, you know, obviously like, I'm I'm giving you guys huge, you know, like props and for everything that you've been doing. And I I can't wait to go out on tour with you guys again. And uh, oh, for those of you uh, watching and listening, it's literally it's bistoblanco.com, b e a s t b l a n c o. See, I can still spell. I mean, hey. um, <laughs> but so but I mean, if you need a place to start, some of my favorite songs are Dark Matter, Solitary Rave, and Grind, uh, right. among others. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good. And, oh, and, that, song. And time- that song, just real quick, the opening line that's inspired from my mother. I may not have been born with a crown on my head, but mom gave me muscles and knuckles instead. That yeah. is that is that woman. And you saw a picture of her. Oh yeah. She's 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 all muscles and knuckles, man. <laughs> yeah. like, um, man. Oh, I, I love you, Chuck. We got a couple more minutes and I, I just have to ask you one more thing um because i thought it was so inspiring so like uh right after i think it was right after christmas we you and i and um our good friend uh richie faulkner uh were jamming uh, you know right before for that nam convention and when you yes. and I, you and joe and i got together to jam i was um, in hailstorm for a couple of minutes it was yeah, amazing he was in hailstorm for a full like <laughs> seven minutes long it's, it was great <laughs> um so yeah we did this nam jam together and we played i miss the misery so um, we were doing some stuff at, at, in the studio at the time and Chuck came to the studio and we got to jam and, and yeah. you, you told me this beautiful story about how, so, so I, forgive me for, for not knowing all of the details, but, um, uh, you got, you, obviously you've gotten the opportunity to play with many legends, but, yeah. uh, right around Christmas time, maybe a little after Christmas time, I know that, uh, Shep puts on something in Hawaii that you end up going to, and you, yeah. got, to, you got to play with some musicians that oh, you had played with before. And, and you were so like giddy. Would, would you kind of walk me through that a little bit? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'll retell the story. I love to, uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> let me talk about myself. Um, no, but, uh, so Shep Gordon, Alice Cooper's manager, longtime manager, 40 some odd years. Um, has uh, a charity event in Maui every year that that feeds uh, uh, the hungry in, in, in Maui. Uh, and it's a wonderful event. And, and Ig Shep has so graciously appointed me as musical director. So throughout the years, there's been guys that we back up, like Steven Tyler and Michael McDonald and Pat Simmons from the Doobie Brothers, Weird Al, Linda Carter, um, Sammy Hagar. And it's just, a, it's a riot. It's so much fun. And every year you think, oh, how could next year even beat this year? So the last year, this last year, this last um, New Year's Eve, we um, we were there in Maui and we were having a great time. And a couple of the artists on the list were, you know, I was who I just love so much, but Steven Tyler couldn't make it this year, but was Lucas Nelson, Willie Nelson's son. I don't know if many of you out there, if you're aware of him, that this kid has got it. He's phenomenal. You know, what a songwriter and uh, what a voice and what a talent. What just a great guy. Uh, and I was so excited to back him up. And I remember there was another bass player kind of bidding for that. Hey, I'll back up Lucas. Um, you know, I play with him in, in Maui all the time. I go, no, 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 no. I, I got it. He, he requested me, <laughs> which was a complete lie, but I wanted to play these songs with him so badly. And uh, we backed up, uh, you know, Weird Al and uh, Linda Carter, and there's all these people. But there was word that, uh, you know, Willie was going to come down and, and, and jam with us, you know, which was, 
exciting but nerve wracking at the time. And I don't know how much time we got, but the one thing you got to know about Willie Nelson is that there is no arrangement, there is no time signature, and there is no idea how long the song is going to go for or what's going to happen next or in between. He and I've jammed with him one other time in the past, and it was frightening because it's it's the weirdest thing ever. Because you, you, the guy just is, it, it, he's just knows so many songs, and you just gotta kind of keep up with them. And as a bass player, you gotta make sure you're following the arrangement. You can't just come in as a harp player. Or, I'm not giving discredit to any of the other musicians, but you gotta be on it. And uh, so we got the opportunity to, um, you know, jam with with Willie Nelson, which was such an honor and um but um the best was so it was doors were at six o'clock and it's now four o'clock and we've got to rush and go get showered and get ready to do this performance and we've been working all day on everything shep goes hey um so you're and i go yeah what's up um you know he says uh you heard of paul simon and i go uh, yeah, yeah. He goes, yeah. So Paul wants to come in and jam tonight with us. I go, hey, Shep, wait, <laughs> we've got no time, man. Like for real. And I'm thinking this is amazing and exciting, but at the, at the same time, it's like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? And he goes, um, he wants to do this song, uh, um, bottoms of your shoe, shoes, something about your shoes. And I'm going, oh, my God. So I, I, he goes, Lucas knows. So I call Lucas. And Lucas saw, yeah, man, he, he probably wants to do, uh, you know, diamonds on the soles of her shoes. And I go, oh, okay. And uh, he goes, uh, I'll come over and we'll, we'll go through the arrangement really quick. I go, okay. So I gather the guys, everybody. I go, hey, guys, we're doing this song. Everybody's like, oh, what key is it in? I go, I have no idea. <laughs> What's the arrangement? I have no idea. I don't know anything. All I know is we got about 15 minutes to figure this out. Oh, and by the way, it's Paul Simon. So we got, I had a percussionist. I had a drummer. I had a keyboard player. I had an amazing guitar player there, uh, myself on bass. And then Lucas comes in. And uh, so Lucas basically just says, I think it's an F sharp. And I'm not sure if he's going to want to do it this way or that way. We'll know when he starts doing it. Okay. So we didn't jam anything so much as we let the percussionist and the drummer get the feel for the song. And the funny thing is, is um, I'm so the night comes, we're ready. Here comes Paul Simon. And I'm standing there and he comes up and stands next to me. And I and I look at him. I said, hey, Paul, I'm I'm Chuck. Uh, I'll, I'll be playing bass with you tonight. And he goes, all right. Right on, man. Thanks for doing it. I go, yeah, no problem. I go, I go. Uh, I hope we do you justice. And he goes, that's ah, easy. It's just an African groove. <laughs> <laughs> right? So you know how often Lizzie and, and Joe and, and, you, know. and guys, you guys are jamming on some African grooves over there and stuff, huh? Really laying it down. I mean, like, you know. It's like breathing. <laughs> yeah, I know, the African group. So, but what resonated to me was when I thought, when he, when he said that, I instantly froze and stopped breathing and I couldn't function for a couple of minutes. I had to think, what does he mean, African groove? So I thought, okay, it's got to be reggae thingy. And I did because I heard the drum patterns and stuff and I'd listen to the song. And I go, what I really need to do is make my 73 Fender P bass sound like a fretless bass. So that's what I did. I grooved on it and I would just go bang and just do these slides and stuff. And but the beautiful thing was we didn't know the arrangement. We didn't know anything. And it starts off. He just walks up to the mic and starts singing a cappella. Oh, no. <laughs> and Lucas joins in on the harmony. And it's this beautiful thing. It's happening. It's it's happening. This this is happening. This is real. This music is is happening. It's real. It's it's there's no there's no rehearsal. There's no nothing. And we're just standing there like waiting for the go. You know, when is the go? When are we gonna start this thing? And then we you feel it, you feel the tension, and you feel the music starting to resonate, and all of a sudden it resolves into the part. And the band just kicks in and we go into the groove and I'm and playing the African bass groove that I've done once, you know, in my hotel room 15 minutes ago. And it was beautiful and it was awesome. And uh, the one thing we had worked out 
in, in our conversations was there was a middle section where um, it was going to break down to this drum groove and we had it worked out. We were going to go, and they go and the crowd gets into it. Well, we're looking at each other. Everybody's making eye contact. Okay, man. Okay. Okay. Time for the, and right before we're going to do it, Paul goes, and now everybody's going, wait, no, we we're going to do this. And he's, break it down, break it down. So now we're in a totally other, we sidetracked into this <laughs> other thing that Paul Simon has a totally different plan for us. And it was awesome. And it was fun. And it was nerve wracking. And it was exciting. And it was everything that music is supposed to be. Because oh. you were in it. In yep. it. That's, uh, dude, that's, that's like that's where life happens, man. It's like when you're just in it and you, and you don't know, like it could be a complete train wreck or it could be this beautiful moment that you're never going to forget. But, but that's up to everybody listening to each other and paying attention. And, yeah. and that's live music, man. So yeah. that's, especially that's- with guys that you admire so much, you know, cause Lizzie, we're all, you and I both, you know, we're such fans and we have such, you know, we hold our friendship so dearly with these people that we grew up listening to. And it's such an honor for us to be here and play with them. And, and, and I, 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 as excited as I am for this song to happen, I'm also excited for it to end because I just want it to end. So I know that it went okay, but I got to remember to live in the middle there and then soak it all in. Oh, that's awesome, man. And I, you know, again, you're just, you, you inadvertently is just, you know, life wisdom here. It's maybe it's the beard. It's definitely the, it's the there. Beard. you're speaking through the beard. <laughs> the yeah. beard. <laughs> yeah, uh, but man, uh, we're, we're uh, yeah, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> um, but uh, so we're, we're we're getting here um to the to the end of the show. I, I just um I could talk to you all day. I know. And, uh, and man, if 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 that isn't coming full circle, you know, remember people, Chuck said it: fear over love. I'm sorry, love over fear. Absolutely. You know, always, always approach something. You have a choice either to approach any situation that you're in, whether it be a pandemic or anything else going on in this world, you know, a, a live show, you have the choice, you oh. know, you harness that yeah. love. Can I just say one thing Of course. about that? There's when it comes to fear, love. So anything that's evolving in fear, which is going to be jealousy, resentment, separation, anything that makes you feel that you're, you, you know, that is hatred, anger, um, all those things, you just consider those red words, those words, um, they think they're in charge, but they're not. What you got to focus on are the things that make you feel good, joy, love, family, uh, passion, all those things. Those are the only things you need to pay attention to. Trust me, the red words are going to be there all the time. But the more you start to pay attention to the stuff that is more positive, then those other words, those other things, they start to lose value. They start to figure out that they are no longer in charge because they think they're in charge. Depression thinks it's in charge of you. It's not. You have to tell it that it's not. But the only way to do that is for you to trick, to start changing the way you think. And it's not easy. I'm not saying it's the quick thing because everybody has good days and bad days. I have them all the time. But it's, it's how much time are you really going to give these things that are only there to destroy you? How much are you really going to believe in those things? Or are you really going to believe the things that come easy, the things that make you feel good? I'm going to go with the love side of things. I'm not saying I'm a hippie or I'm all peace and love and all those kinds of things. But I'm tired of living in doubt. I'm tired of living depressed. I'm tired of living like I can't do something. It's no fun to me. Hell yeah, man. You know? Amen. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I agree. And I know a lot of people, you know, watching right now really needed to hear that, including myself. It's it's important to remind ourselves of that. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, hearing it out of, out of your words, the badass that you are, you know, um, I it's something that that we talk about a lot all the time about the show and that, you know, you you do have that choice. And that, that's yeah. such a great way to say that is to, yeah. everyone stay away from those red words, man. They are doing you <laughs> no, no service, no service. Um well, you know, I'm going to let you go here, Chuck, but I really appreciate you being on the show and for you being my friend. Yeah. And um, and everybody, make sure that you go to bistoblanca.com. They got videos and all their stuff is up there. Go stream their music. It's You really will not be disappointed uh-huh. at all. Um, and I love you and I can't wait to see you. 
I love you so much and I can't thank you enough. You've been instrumental in the career of Bisto and and I I just am so I just I love that we our friendship has come this far, you know, and I, I just am I appreciate you and I appreciate Joe and the whole Hellstorm family. And I love the fact that you can bring up your mom and your dad and I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> It's special. It's awesome. And thank you for having me and keep up what you're doing and keep raising your voice, Lizzie, because um, it's important. And not only I'm not talking about your singing voice, I'm talking about what's coming from your heart and uh, people listen and you have such a positive, strong message. And uh, I think it's super important that you keep being the activist that you are because it's, 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 it's a strong message and it's the right message. Oh, thank you, Chuck, so much. Friggin' Chuck Garrick, everybody. Um, what a dude. And uh, and I will definitely see you soon. Um, everybody, up next, uh, next week, I have my good friend Leah Welbum of Boston's own alternative rock group, Slothrust. Um, so super newbie. Um, it, th we've we've been friends for a little while, and um, I know about her, her band and everything, but this is the first time we're actually going to sit down and really dig deep. So make sure you check that out next week. Um, again, check out BistoBlanca.com. Until next week, everybody. Everybody stay positive, stay safe, stay connected, and raise your horns. We'll see you next time. Bye, guys. Yeah, hey, you're yeah. in. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Welcome to the internet. Never lost that spirit and soul for turning people on to music that we love. Linda Perry calls your, your phone, uh, you pick up. You know, we like to share the process here, and uh, I think we may have some fun. I feel what we're curating is really great information, great entertainment. Anytime, call me, I'm there. I still am into that. It's the ILO Show with Danita Sparks. Tonight's guests, Moon Unit Zappa, Gary French, Finnish House Youthwa, Blue Man Group. Video art by Animal Charm. Here's Danita. Hello, and welcome to the High Low Show with me, Danita Sparks. Thank you so much for being here again. Great to see you. You guys played me in. That's so refreshing, but shitless is an interesting choice. Do you guys play any other L7 songs, or is it just shitless? <laughs> forward why don't you guys learn some more l7 songs and i think that'll be really great for the show thank you so much for being here all the way from helsinki and i hope you like the new sauna set we sent you guys okay many blessings all right well we have a great show for you tonight so let's get on with the show Tonight is a writer and a comic who regularly podcasts for Third and Fairfax, the podcast of the Writers Guild of America West. She also makes art and tea. 
Ladies and gentlemen, get ready for the far out and fabulous Moon Unit Zappa! mentioned, we here at the High Low Show like to share the process. Let you all peek behind the curtain, get under the hood, peel back the skin, dissect the frog as it were. To start, there's a lot of work that goes into our karaoke segment each week. We have a big crew, a mobile satellite truck, a research team. We even have someone on our staff I refer to as our musical Shafkan, who matches each guest with the best song for them to sing. But every show, I like to have a little one-on-one -on -one time with my guest to make sure we're on the same creative page. A little right side of the brainstorming session to make sure we're singing in the appropriate key. Let's have a listen. Moon, I have some different keys for the song here for us to zero in on. What do you think of this one? Uh, that one sounds a little six feet underground. Okay, how about this? A bit low. Okay, how about this? We're getting there. Can a little, little higher? How about this? Uh, we're getting in the range. Can, do you have a higher version? Okay, what about this? I mean, if we're going to go for it, we should really go for it. I say we hit the highest version we can stand. What about this? I mean, let's go stratosphere. Wanna? This? We're getting there. This? We're getting there. This? We're getting there. This? We're getting there. This? Oh, <laughs> yeah, we're in the pocket now. We got it.
oh man, I'm not 100% sure this Finnish house band's gonna work out. Their repertoire is limited and there's cultural differences and time zone weirdness. The press keeps confusing them with this Swedish house mafia. I'm just not sure they're gonna work out. I've got an idea. I'm gonna call my friend Carrie Chaos. She's a DJ at Luxuria Music and she's always got her finger on the pulse of the scene. Maybe she has some information about Lou Man Group. You know, I haven't seen him picketing out there in over a week. It's like Lou Man's forgotten about me. I'm gonna zoom her. Hey Carrie, how's it going? Oh, pretty good. Oh, I see you're making good use of this stay at home time. Are, are you dusting your entire Barbie collection? Yeah, can you believe it? Finishing up the late 60s, moving into the 70s. Well, grooving into the 70s. <laughs> oh, wow, that's so cool. You're finally moving into the 70s. Good work. You know, I've been meaning to ask you, have you seen Lou Man around? Yeah, he swung by my house the other day after he went out joyriding with the group. Yeah? How's he doing? He's fine, but he's pissed. Well, pissed at you, anyway. <laughs> I thought you had a new house band. Oh, God, I don't know. They, they don't seem to be working out. Well, this might be a stretch, but there is a tribute to the Lou Man group out there performed by some very well-known guys. Maybe they could work out for you. What? A tribute to an homage band? Oh my god, that's so meta. I love it. Oh, trust me, it is meta meta. As some of you know, and many of you may still be confused by, my regular house band, Lou Man Group, is an homage performance band to Lou Reed and Blue Man Group. So you can imagine how excited I am to share with you tonight this tribute to Lou Man Group's homage to Blue Man Group's tribute to Lou Reed. Well, Meta Meta gets very confusing. All you need to know is, ladies and gentlemen, here is Sister Ray by Lou Reed, performed by the real Blue Man Group.
another long day. But what am I gonna do, leave showbiz? Mm. Yeah? Danita, hey, I don't have much time to talk. I just emailed you an encrypted link. Password is gorilla. Am I in trouble? What's going on? Danita, listen to me. Watch the link. I secretly obtained some footage through my sources and Lou Man and his manager saw the Blue Man Group performances on your show. We may have made a mess of things. Well, for you anyway. Ciao for now. Have you seen this? Huh? Have you seen this? Does this not phase you? I'm concerned. But nobody believes in original ideas anymore. It's not one truly creative spark. It's not one creative endeavor anymore that's not Influenced. Season desist. Ah, oh, no. Ah, oh, no. Ah, oh, no. Oh, no. Now I'd like to play an L7 song from our 1994 album, Hungry for Stink. And this song is called... Andre.
All right, and that's our show, episode six. Thank you so much for watching. I want to thank my special guests, Moon Unit Zappa, Carrie French, the Finnish House Band, and Blue Man Group. So until next time, always stay high-low.